Greetings and welcome to another lecture in psychopathology. In this lecture, we are continuing with the neurocognitive disorders, starting out with some disorders that are associated with other things. Um, so they're not necessarily standalone, but they're associated with other disorders. For instance, infection with HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. Now, HIV, of course, causes AIDS, which is essentially the uh, body's immune system breaking down, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And so HIV can cause neurocognitive deficits, not only because it makes it easier for the body to be invaded by uh, things like parasites and various type of fungal infections, but it can also damage the brain directly. It does seem like this is one of those viruses that either can pass the blood-brain barrier or can somehow affect the brain beyond it. And so it can cause the brain to atrophy, the brain to actually lose neurons. It can cause inflammation. We've already talked a lot about inflammation and the problems it causes. Swelling, which can go along with the inflammation. Demyelinization. Okay. When you demyelinate something, it means that normally the axon that is myelinated to allow for the signals to be sent faster and longer distances, those axons lose their myelin. They lose their insulation. The signal can no longer be sent. Now, this, of course, these, these associated deficits are going to be worse when a person is not being treated. The treatment for HIV at this point is to give a uh, cocktail of antiretroviral drugs that essentially prevent the virus from dividing, at least from dividing out of control. And very often, people on these antiretrovirals, um, if they are tested for presence of the virus, they sh don't show any virus. This doesn't mean that there isn't the virus still lurking in them somewhere ready to come out, but it simply means that the amount of the bloodstream is so low that it's essentially absent. But even with that, it does look like that people with HIV, that their brains can and do age faster. And in fact, they may show signs of things like Alzheimer's disease and whatnot at a younger age. And this isn't the early onset that's caused by genetics. This is simply uh, because of the stress and wear and tear that these deficits can show up earlier. And almost certainly the damage that HIV can cause is going to show up before the diagnosis. Even today, most people aren't diagnosed the instant or even fairly soon after they are exposed before they catch this particular virus. It can be weeks, months, years. And during that time, just like with Alzheimer's, the problems are occurring even though they may not be noticeable. So I suppose the ideal would be to have somebody caught the instant they catch it and put them on the antiretrovirals and hope that therefore there would be no damage. And that's a possibility, but we don't really do that. There are people that are on what are called PrEP, which are pre-exposure prophylactics, which basically means that uh, we're treating them for uh, the HIV virus before they catch it in the hopes that they never catch it, that uh, this, this pretreatment prevents the virus from getting a toehold in the body. Uh, we don't know what that will do in terms of this. I suspect those studies will be coming at some point. Other neurocognitive disorders that can be caused by problems include those caused by vascular disease. These used to be called the vascular dementias. A vascular essentially is blood vessels. So what we're usually talking about here is some form of a lot of tiny little strokes. Uh, so uh, TIAs, transient ischemic attacks. Uh, what usually happens here is there is a blockage. The ischemic strokes uh, are caused by something blocking a blood vessel like a blood clot or a chunk of, <coughs> of plaque that has built up in the bloodstream. Something is blocking the blood flow. And when blood flow is blocked, particularly if it's a major blood vessel, there are going to be problems with lack of oxygen, lack of nutrients in the area served by that blood vessel, and that area can therefore be damaged and die. That's, that's a stroke, essentially, when it happens in the brain. So it can wind up with a person having what looks like Alzheimer's disease, except when you examine the brain with the brain scan, you don't necessarily see the plaques and tangles. So it's not Alzheimer's. What you see are evidence of lots and lots and lots of tiny little strokes. <laughs> 
and the body can actually recover from a certain number of tiny little strokes. We don't know what that is. It depends on how big they are, on what area they occur in. Eventually, that damage is going to add up, and that's what we're looking at here. This appears to be something that affects more men than women. Um, probably because men are more likely to have these sort of atherosclerotic, uh, the, high, the high cholesterol problems. And there are fewer people with this than Alzheimer's, although a possibility as to why there are fewer people with vascular dementia than with Alzheimer's may be simply because uh, there's a very fine line between a tiny little stroke and a stroke that will kill you. So therefore, the numbers may simply be smaller, not because there are fewer people having these little strokes. It's just that the little strokes are much more likely to kill someone than the early stages of Alzheimer's are. Uh, this can be managed by essentially treating arteriosclerosis, which is working on blood cholesterol, keeping blood cholesterol levels low, keeping inflammation low, because there's some evidence that inflammation in blood vessels makes it more likely that that cholesterol will stick to the blood vessels and therefore eventually either narrow the blood vessel to the point where it can be easily blocked or where the cholesterol chunk could break loose and travel through the body and cause some serious problems. So essentially treating this will help to reduce the amount of these sorts of vascular diseases. A neurocognitive disorder characterized by profound memory impairment is also known as amnestic disorder. Amnestic, of course, coming from amnesia. And so generally what you see here, I've actually talked about this a little bit when I talked about alcohol, because uh, one of the major ones of these is Korsakoff's disorder. But what happens in this neurocognitive disorder characterized by profound memory impairment? Psychologists like these days to name things exactly what they are, even if it's a really long name is there is a real problem with memory in that what just happened in the last 10, 15, 30 seconds, people can remember. What happened 15, 20, 30 years ago, people can remember. Everything else in between is gone. And you see a little bit of this basically with Alzheimer's disease, but this by definition is not Alzheimer's disease because there's no plaques and tangles and such like. That's the reason why Alzheimer's disease used to be a diagnosis of last resort because they'd have to rule out all of this first before we could actually do brain imaging to find the plaques and tangles. Um, otherwise, things are fine, which may be another thing that separates it from Alzheimer's disease. We don't have the delusions or the hallucinations or the feelings of jealousy and persecution. Now, procedural memory is also fine. Procedural memory is how to do things. Procedures. Episodic memory, you're probably hopefully remembering this from, from general psych. Episodic memory is memory of memories of things that you did. Procedural memories are memories about things like how to walk and eat with a fork and ride a bicycle, drive a car. I mean, whatever, how to write. I mean, th those are procedural memories, how to juggle. Those tend to be fine, even in someone with Korsakoff's. Those are fine. What is gone are the personal memories that basically our past uh, short-term memory. Short-term memory is usually pretty good, but something is happening to prevent that short-term memory from being sent to long-term memory. Now, the memories that are already in long-term memory can be retrieved, at least for a while. These also tend to be progressive in that they'll lose more and more and more and more memories. But generally, we tend to think of this as not being able to form new memories. It's more of an anterograde than a retrograde. Now, things other than drinking all your meals can also cause this. Head trauma. Uh, can cause this sort of thing. Although with head trauma, very often, particularly if it's minor, this sort of amnesia will be temporary. Having stroke surgery, whenever uh, the doctors go into the brain and start cutting neurons, we're probably going to be losing memories because memories seem to be stored all over the brain. Hypoxia, lacks of oxygen, encephalitis, uh, inflammation of the encephalon, infl inflammation of part of the brain. All of these things can also cause this sort of amnestic dementia, amnestic disorder. And lastly, but not least, we have head injury, head trauma. Basically, what we're talking about here in many cases is a traumatic brain injury, which is also abbreviated as, as a TBI. Traumatic brain injuries can be caused by all sorts of things. Falls is actually the most common cause, particularly in the elderly. They fall, they hit their head, they cause damage. 
um, motor vehicle accidents, assaults, uh, you know, be, being hit in the head, sports injuries, explosions, anything that's going to rattle the brain can definitely cause a problem. And I do want to point out the difference between a closed head injury and a penetrating head injury. When I was pointing out the anatomy of the skull and the protection for the brain at the beginning of this chapter, I was talking about protection from penetrating head injury, something going into the brain from the outside. But a closed head injury is an injury that occurs without anything penetrating the brain. Essentially, what happens if a person hits their head or their head is hit by something is just like people in a car without seat belts. If the car hits something, they're going to fly around. If your head gets hit with something, your brain is going to slosh kind of back and forth. There's not a lot of space to slosh, so the brain can get bruised. And the other thing is your skull has some very sharp edges to it on the inside that normally are not a problem because the cerebral spinal fluid and the various uh, you know, a dura mater help protect your brain from injury. But if your brain is sloshing around, there definitely can be problems being caused here without anything really being visible on the surface. A concussion is an injury to the brain that results in a temporary loss of functioning. Okay. Now, concussions are very often, we tend to think of concussions and things like sports, but you can also get concussions from falling and hitting your head, from somebody hitting you on the head, uh, from an explosion that causes, I mean, there's, there's also the, the sound wave that comes and hits you. All sorts of things can cause a concussion. And it's a temporary loss of functioning. It may come back, it may not. The damage from concussions tends to be cumulative. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, encephalopathy is something that there's, they've been talking about a whole lot in the last five to ten years, particularly in football players who have been hit and hit and hit and hit and probably had multiple concussions, both diagnosed and not, or went back to play with concussions and hurt their brain more. Your brain is very sensitive when it's had a concussion. It's very easy to damage it again. Males tend to show signs of this from football. Females tend to show more signs from soccer. This is not to say that males who play soccer don't show signs of it. It's just that football is such a worse one. Hockey, too. But even bouncing a ball off your head can cause a cumulative injury, even if it doesn't seem to do a lot of damage at the moment. Small hits matter. Now, of course, the ones that result in unconsciousness are the big problem. Those are the ones that we tend to pay attention to. But even the small hits that aren't a big deal, that don't cause unconsciousness, they can add up. They can cause problems. Okay. Now, the ones that do result in unconsciousness may cause changes in bodily functioning, uh, may cause problems with blood pressure, that sort of thing, may cause the various types of amnesia. Retrograde is when you can't help and what remember before, can't remember what happened before the injury, and interrograde is when you can't remember what happened after the injury. The immediate treatment is that with any concussion, any sort of traumatic brain injury, you're going to have brain swelling. Because when you injure your body, it swells. When you injure your brain, it swells. And as I mentioned before, there's not a lot of extra space for your brain to swell inside of your skull. So what can happen here is people can be given medications to reduce swelling all the way up to people may have portions of their skulls removed to allow the brain to swell without damaging itself. It gives it an outlet to push out, at least temporarily. Trust me, you don't want to do that, but it's better than leaving the brain, the skull closed and letting the brain squish itself against the inside of the skull. Sorry about the possible graphic images. Long-term treatment is indeed very, very long. It's also very difficult. With brain injuries, remember, most of the time when neurons die, they don't come back. There's no real way to fix that. There may be ways to treat it to, to fix the problems maybe to treat the symptoms medication might help but it doesn't always rehab to maybe learn to use non-damaged area of the brains that might help therapy in order to be able to deal with the changing cognitions the changing emotions that come with it but yeah long-term treatment is difficult it's much better to as much as possible avoid getting that traumatic brain injury in the first place which is why people wear seat belts and wear helmets and, you know, we, we try to avoid knocking each other unconscious, hopefully. <laughs>